Welcome to today's programme. My guest is former Royal Marine, now priest, Nigel Mumford. Nigel, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you for having me. Good oh, to see you. Delighted to have you, Nigel. We've been friends for a number of years. We have. Great to have you on the programme mm. to tell us a little of your story. Now, you were born in Plymouth. Yes, many years ago. Many <laughs> years ago. Yes, yes, yes. There's an interesting little story that when you were about seven years of age, your teacher said to you that you wouldn't amount to anything. Yes. Why did the teacher say that? Because I wasn't very good at math or English or history or geography, but it was my mathematics teacher who said that in front of the whole class. It destroyed me between seven and 11. At 11 years old, I went to a uh, boarding school. Uh, no, at, at seven, I went to boarding school uh, after leaving that school. And then I started to learn later on in life. But there's a block of my life where I didn't learn. My handwriting was atrocious. I should have been a doctor. But it broke my heart. But it wasn't until I, I discovered that uh, Winston Churchill was told the same thing. He was told at seven years old that he is useless and looked at what happened to him. So, you know. As many others as well. Absolutely, yeah. I love telling teachers that because they're horrified. Then I get to pray for them. It's an evangelistic tool to, to segue into to healing. But then when you uh, left school, you joined the Royal Marines. I did, yes. And on your way to joining the Royal Marines, mm. you ha did have an amazing encounter with Jesus. I certainly did. Tell yeah. us about that. Well, I'd finished basic training, seven months, not seven weeks, seven months basic. It was rough. I mean, it was really hell on earth, to be honest. But it was uh, a week before I went to combat in Northern Ireland. And um, I was waiting for a train. And this, uh, in front of the YMCA, it was raining. And this kid comes out of the YMCA. He was 16, I was 19. And he's, he comes out and says, would you like to meet Jesus? And I said, I thought they killed him 2,000 years ago. <laughs> so I said, oh, I've got nothing to lose. I could be dead in a week. And I was you know, quite concerned because the training for Northern Ireland was, was rough. Um, anyway, we went in and I met Jesus. I mean, he, he said, sit down here uh, and I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to be silent and you know you, you'll be able to speak and I said I, I'm a marine you've got to tell me what to say I don't know I don't know what to say so he he, he finished praying and then there's a silence deafening silence and it felt like it was 15 minutes but it was more like 15 seconds and then I, I looked at the altar and there was a light on the cross and I heard myself say I see the light I heard myself say it it was not a conscious effort and at that moment I knew I knew I knew that Jesus was real Yes, so your Christianity that had been nominal yes. had just come alive. Exactly, yes. However, uh, years before, we'd gone to a um, Billy Graham uh, revival and with my dad, and everybody was going forward. I was seven, I think, when I, or eight, and I, I got up out of my chair to go forward, and, and my dad said, Nigel, we don't do that, we're British. Yes. <laughs> That actually happened. So I could have had a revival at, uh, or, or be born again with, with Billy Graham, but it wasn't until later. And I would, you know, I would call that foxhole religion, really, because I knew that I could be dead in a month. So then you then went to Northern mm -hmm. Ireland yeah, 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 as yeah. a Marine. Yes. Tell us about your experience there. Well, I was there three times, four months at a, at a time, um, and it was very unpleasant. I was there in 72, uh, 73 and 74 in the midst of the, the, the troubles. It was very bad. Um, I saw a lot of death. I saw one of my best friends shot. Um, I was blown up five times, shot at three times. And I'm smiling because Churchill said, there's nothing so exhilarating as being shot at and not being hit. And I was thoroughly disagreeing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the noise, the anger of a bullet going past your ear, the violence of that hornet noise, which you'll never forget, it was uh, right ear, left knee, right knee. And just a fraction either way, I wouldn't be here today. And that noise is, is a haunting noise of, of, of absolute fear. But luckily, none of those bullets or rounds had my name on it. I'm still here. <laughs> yes, your life was preserved. Mm -hmm. But obviously, it had an effect upon you. Very much so. And some of your f friends and colleagues, they died. They did, yes. Well, what happened, I was a drill instructor for the last two years. 
Now, what's a drill instructor? Well, a drill instructor is basically the uncle, the nanny, the granny. Uh, we teach them how to stand, how to drill, how to march, uh, everything involved in the presentation of being a Marine, including husbandry, you know, how to iron, how to polish your boots, how to, you know, spit and polish the, the fronts of the boots. And it was, it was, it was a tough job. It really was. I, I like to say I used to make grown men cry, but now I'm a priest. I still make grown men cry. And I actually made a two-star general cry the other day, so I feel pretty good at that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's ironic, really. You know, it really is. Now, in your, in your life, uh, there were a number of occasions, Nigel, when you nearly died. Oh, yes. Like, you went scuba diving. Tell us about that. That's right. In 1975, I was stationed in Malta with 4-1 Commando, Royal Marines. <laughs> and I did everything you're not supposed to do. I, we rented equipment. It was a Sunday morning. I had a hangover. Uh, you don't go diving with a hangover. I'd never had any instructions in diving before. And the first test was fine, it was great. It was with eight other people. Um, and then I went off down to 70 feet. I sat on the ground looking up, thinking, oh, this is, this is amazing. And I looked up and water went up my nose and I choked at 70 feet and I panicked. And I shot up as fast as I could, knowing that I had to exhale. And my air just kept coming out. I broke the surface. My weight belt was too hard. I remember screaming help. I ripped off my mask um, and I couldn't get, it, couldn't get the mask back on. I couldn't get the, bre the breathing on. But the weight belt was so heavy, it dragged me under. I shouted help a couple of times and that was it. I remember two things happened. One was, was it was just like a, a slideshow of my life, just picture, picture, picture. And then as I knew I had to breathe uh, and I knew I was gonna die. I knew I was gonna be breathing in water in my next breath. And when I breathed in, this incredible peace came upon me. It was, it was, it was beautiful, this peace that does, does pass all understanding came upon me, absolutely lovely. I saw this yellow tube. You know, when we think of heaven, we look up thinking that's heaven, but it's also over the horizon. And this yellow tube started to suck me up into the tube and then suddenly blank. And I woke up, I, I was obviously rescued, I was resuscitated, uh, luckily. I woke up in the back of a car that I'd rented, th throwing up vast quantities of seawater on my way to the hospital. <laughs> so who rescued you? I don't know. I never had a chance to say thank you. I have no idea who did. Not a clue. But the, one of the divers, the, the only diver of the six of us or eight of us went, uh, was the guy who was driving my rental car in Malta. So it was an amazing moment. And you've, you've had many other near-death experiences? About 14. Tell us about a, a couple more of... Well, I, I would include the three bullets, very close shaves, five, five uh, bombs. I remember being hit so badly, I, I was thrown backwards. Uh, I was checking my ears for blood and various other, made sure everything else was there, if you know what I mean. Um, and, and, and being deaf for about three years, uh, three, three days. It was extraordinary, it was frightening as heck, it really was. But the, the main one was the swine flu. Yeah, wh wh when did you contract swine flu? 2009, uh, I'd come over to England to speak on trauma for the Royal Air Force, um, and I picked it up then. Um, it was wh rough. When did yeah. you become aware that you weren't well? Um, well, I'd, I'd come over here, uh, I think flying back I started coughing. I went to a conference where I was coughing badly um, on healing with um, Francis and Judith McNutt. Yeah, somewhere in, in, in wherever it was, I can't remember now. But the, I remember the, the heater and the cooler was covered in, in it was filthy. I thought we, they thought I had a Legionnaire's disease, actually. That was the problem. Um, and it wasn't for 10 days until they, the CDC discovered I, I was, uh, had a very bad dose of, of swine flu. But, but, but tell rough. us more, though. It was a wow. serious oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. illness, oh, yeah. Yeah. sickness. Yes. What were the consequences? Well, uh, just coughing uncontrollably for, for about two days with no, no sleep. So they put me in a induced coma. And I remember that vividly. It was a moment where I said goodbye to my wife, thinking, uh, this is probably it. Um, I remember her walking out of the room and then lights out. And then some amazing things happened. Amazing, I went to heaven a bunch of times. And it was absolutely extraordinary. What, while you're in the coma, what you, you had like visions? Mm -hmm. Yes, vivid visions, vivid. The first one was um, of a blade of grass. It was just a single blade of grass. I felt like I spent days looking at the single blade of grass. And then as, as it panned back, there were hundreds of blades of grass. And then there were three granite steps, <coughs> three, 
and with three white tulips, absolutely perfect. And then I saw my house, uh, and it was made of glass. There was no kitchen, but in the in the bottom of the house, it was actually diamond shape, um, and living water ran through the bottom of the house. And in each room, there's a there's a, a flap uh, with a gold chain and a gold chalice, and you drank the water, and whatever you wanted, if you wanted fish and chips, it tasted like fish and chips. It was amazing. <laughs> it really was. Um, then uh, uh, a whole lot of visions. Um, I saw the house, you know, the many, many mansions. They're all Victorian, beautiful mansions. Didn't see anybody. Uh, and I. So, so yeah. while you were at Nigel in the coma, yeah. were you aware of conversations that were taking place? No. no. Nothing. But after you came out of the coma, mm. you remembered all these visions? Yes, vividly. It was all biblical, every one of them. Everything was to do so with So, how Jesus do you interpret what was going on? during that time. How, how long were you in the coma? Three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, 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 so I had a lot of time in the coma. There was some nasty stuff that I didn't write about in my book because it was just too nasty to talk about. But the positive, I mean, the biggest thing was, was the peace. It was beautiful. I remember actually when I first knew I was going on a journey, leaving my body and going up, literally up through the roof, through the ceiling of the, of the uh, um, ICU into the sky and floating and I wanted to say goodbye. I tried to say goodbye to my wife and I couldn't turn my head, obviously because of the equipment, I suppose, I don't know. Um, but then I went into heaven and John, I saw this, this bar about a mile across and then six miles high and it was the book of life and it, the pages would turn and I felt the pages turn and on each page there were little white dots <coughs> and I realized each white dot was a soul page after page. It was as if I was looking at the, the book of life. It's extraordinary. Absolutely amazing. Now, obviously, Peaceful. you and I are convinced mm. there is an eternity. Oh, yes. There is a heaven. No doubt. What, what, what would you say to anyone listening today mm. who isn't sure about that? Right. What would you say? It's very real. Uh, there was no fear. You know, I had fear of death for a year <clears throat> in combat, wondering what it would feel like to be shot at and, and blown up. But I have no fear of death now. It is absolutely beautiful. You know, when you know where you're going and when you've lost somebody and you know they're going to heaven, it's, it's so comforting. You can live your life. It's like this great burden on your shoulders has been lifted off. The fear of death, the worry about dying, am I going to go to heaven? To trust God, to live a good life and give your life to Christ. It's life-saving. It really is. And life-giving. Not only life-saving, it's life-giving. I've got to tell you, when I came to, um, out of the coma, um, after the first thing I said was, I love you to my wife. The nurse burst into tears. It was beautiful. They did not think I was going to live. But, but interesting, you know, the Lord preserved you yes. in Northern Ireland. Yes. The Lord preserved you when you went scuba diving in Malta. Clearly. The Lord preserved you even in that condition. Yes. But when you came out of the coma, there was a long period of recovery. Very much so. I had to learn how to, to, to eat. Uh, I, mean, I was paralyzed when I came out of the coma. Uh, then my left side, I'm left-handed, my left side remained uh, inoperable for quite a while, so I was using my right hand to move my left hand. Uh, I had a trach, uh, I had both lungs punctured, I had a uh, bed saw, five-eighths of an inch deep, two fingers wide. I, I mean, it felt like Lazarus. I mean, I was rotting. I was rotting. And I can tell you that's the worst pain I've ever had in my life. Physical pain, unbelievable. Just lying there, being totally reliable on other people, to keep me alive. Had a feeding tube, of course, you know. Um, I could t I'd tell you, well, I won't tell you stories yeah. about that. But, <laughs> but how, how long did it take before you felt back to your normal oh, self? Heavens, about seven months. So I went to a rehab hospital to learn how to get in and out of a car, learn how to walk, um, how to eat, how to drink water, because they didn't want me to choke. You know, it was a, it was a learning process. I had to relearn everything, basically. So now, I mean, you retell that whole story, uh, Dying to Live. Yeah. In fact, I gave you the title. You did, you did. <laughs> yeah. When I read your Brilliant. manuscript, yes. I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a remarkable story, that yeah. just the whole details. Okay, Nigel, as you look back mm. over your life with these pretty dramatic encounters and incidents, mm. how do you interpret what it, was and is that God did and is doing? The way I look at it is he got my attention over and over and over again until I got it. That's how I look at this. 
I've got you. I've got your attention. And now, being in the healing ministry, you know, I get to watch God every day working in people being healed. It, it is very humbling. And the, the so, journey. So, mm. what do you mean, Nigel, about he got your attention? Were you not attentive before? Not really. No, no. I mean, I had you know this foxhole moment of knowing I'm going to war. I could die. I could be dead next week. I may as well have Jesus, you know, in my pocket. You know. So, <laughs> it obviously, deeply impacted. And and yeah. you talk about that hand to hand, and yeah. that mm. in this book. Mm. Mm. What do you t you tell your story? I do, yes, hand to hand from combat to healing. So the, the hand to hand from you know learning how to look after yourself to, to laying hands on people, that journey again from drill instructor to the extraordinary call to this ministry, which was not my plan. I wanted to be a bobby. I wanted to be a policeman. Fail that entrance exam because I wasn't too smart. You know, <coughs> end up in the Marines, toughest thing as I possibly could do. I needed to prove myself, and 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 suddenly I find myself on, in the street. Why do you feel that God allowed all of that to happen? Very good question. I, I think there was a moment, I mean, I had this, this revelation when I knew I'd been called to the healing ministry, incredibly obvious. But I think when I was sick, when I crawled literally through the valley of the shadow of death, when I came out of the coma, I knew God healed other people, but to the point where I'd had my Lazarus experience, where he'd called me out of the cave and taken off the, the grave clothes, which is really what it felt like, um, to know that without doubt, God is still in the business of healing. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Of this, I have no doubt. But he did it to me, having watched other people being healed, when it was my turn to go through this incredible trauma. I lost 68 pounds, I don't know what that is in, in, in kilos or stone, mm. but it, I, was, I was thin, you know. My wife sat with me for 72 straight days, 12 hours a day. Yes. 72 days, and I was dying, you know, I was not expected to live. The do doctor said that was it. Why, I have no idea, but I've never asked that question. And I've just gone with it because I know God loves us, I know he heals, and it was as if to say, look what I can do. But let's go back. So after, how many years were you in the Royal Marines? Nearly eight years. Eight years. Yeah. And then what made you leave? Well, uh, I, I cracked. Uh, four of my recruits were killed, as I was told. Um, and uh, there were, these are guys I was told I'd taken through basic training. So when I was told that, I couldn't speak. I couldn't make any noise at all because I broke. Uh, and then I stuttered for six months. Now, is that because... Uh, an accumulation of trauma yes. eventually tips you over. Absolutely, it's too much. My body couldn't, my brain, my body couldn't take it. And I was diagnosed with World War II shell shock. As it, yeah, as it, as was, it was called as then. As it was called then, yes, in the 70s. Now, of course, PTS. We've dropped the D, the Americans have dropped the D for disorder. Yes. Well, the military have anyway. Um, yes. But it, it is a, you know, a, a classified disorder. What, what I find interesting is I feel like I've been recycled. I've noticed in ministry, I've been doing this for 33 years now, but I've noticed that people who have been healed of cancer have a gift of praying for people with cancer. People who've been divorced understand it and can pray for people who've been divorced. That knock-on effect, that um, redesign, that reinvention is extraordinary. Setting the captives free, absolutely amazing. What did you do when you left the Royal Marines? Marines I worked in Selfridges in the hardware department for a little while. I worked at Parker Knoll, I made furniture, which was dreadful. Uh, nice furniture, but not a good experience. Uh, I worked at, at an antique shop where we, we uh, rented movies out to uh, uh, Pinewood Studios and Elstree Studios, and we made movies, uh, which was wonderful to go and watch, but that's mine, that's mine. I gave that one, you know, it was great. It was very exciting, yeah, lots of fun. And then what did that lead on to? Well, you know, going back to the first time that God called me to this, I'm in my little picture frame shop. I had two at the time. I had 80 employees who were doing very well, you know, framing all sorts of stuff. Even a Georgia O'Keeffe, a man came in my store, threw me this thing, envelope, said, here, frame this. And he said, by the way, I've just bought this from uh, Sotheby's for a million dollars. A million bucks, little piece of paper. So anyway, uh, exactly. Yeah, so you've got a very prosperous. Very prosperous business uh, going. Business yep, going. Absolutely. And a woman walks in and my life has changed in a blink of an eye. What happened? Well, she comes in and she actually looked green. She looked sick. She looked ill. And I said, uh, after You I'd didn't know her? No, 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 no. She was picking up a framing. I had no idea she was. We'd frame something. I'd show her that she liked it. I opened the door to let her out. And I said, are you OK? Just as a, as a passing comment, she's now got a really bad headache. 
And at that moment, I watch my hands <laughs> do this. Now, you don't go plonking your hands on people, let no. alone women. No. This is pre-cell phone. And I, without even thinking, John, I'm, I'm, I'm watching my hands do this. It was not a conscious effort. I didn't conscious, I, it, I'm just watching my hands do this together, boom, on the head. And she said, what did you do? The pain has gone. So the pain, her headache went instantly. instantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, I, I didn't do anything because I knew God had. And that, that set me up immediately in understanding what the healing ministry was about. It was extraordinary, it was terrifying. But then right this was a God yeah. moment, absolutely. wasn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And in the subsequent years, oh. more people came into the That's um, right. yeah. your sh your shop mm -hmm. for healing for than healing. they did yeah. for yeah. Um, yeah. News, frames. Yes, news travel like wildfire. I mean, we were very successful as a framing business, but then more people came in for healing. What they just heard, yeah. and, and they would come and yeah. say, yeah. "Can you pray for yeah. me?" Yeah. My staff were, were terrified because they they were worried, you know because more people were coming in for healing than they were for framing. <laughs> it was incredible, until all of them heard his back lifting a pallet of glass, prayed for him and he was healed. So then you started to see mm. that Jesus is the great physician. Absolutely. He still heals mm. today. Yes. So where did that lead you? To being invited all over the place, to selling the business, selling my house, going to a, a vacant um, a retreat center, that, that I went there for a year with no pay, um, and that rapidly grew. I traveled, praying for people. Um, it was an extraordinary time, well, it still is. I mean, I'm amazed, you know, going from combat to healing and watching God heal others, knowing it's him, not me, in all humility, and to keep that level of, of understanding and knowing that it's God, but to w stand back and watch God at work in others. I mean, there's nothing like it. John, it's like holding a soul in your hand for a moment. That's what it feels like. You've just got that soul in your hand for a little while, but knowing God's going to do something. It's very humbling, beautiful. I know something always happens when we pray. I know, I have no doubt. You then became an ordained minister. I did, 2005, yes. Much to my shock, I, I only thought I was going to be a deacon. Deacons work with the poor, the weak, sick and the lonely. And my bishops decided I should be a, a, a vicar, a priest. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> how long have you been in what we would call the ministry? Uh, since 2005. So, so that's, you've been uh, doing uh, yeah, yes. I'm not good at math. I told you. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, 17 years is it? I don't know what it is. So <laughs> as you look back, yeah. Nigel, over your life, yeah. and all the little picture frames, which of course you were a picture framer, mm -hmm. as mm. what is it? that you, you, you see, you see the hand of God even from the age of seven yes. when your mm -hmm. teacher said that yeah. you're useless, mm. I, I think it was something, you're Absolutely. useless you're, and, and you're you're amount to nothing. You amount to nothing. Yeah. 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 You went back to your school, didn't you? Well, I went back to the boarding school. I didn't go back to Plymouth College where I was told that. I haven't been back there. I'd love to talk to the teacher now and, and, and have a chat with him. When I tell teachers my story, they're horrified. And they ask for forgiveness. They ask me to forgive them for what, they, for what that man did. But you know what, I think like Churchill, it gave me a, gave me a sense of, you know, I, I can, it gave me a sense of perseverance, particularly in the Marines. You know, I always said, I must, I can, and I will. I must, I can, and I will to get my Green Beret. But when, that moment when I knew God, then I changed it to, I can, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. But words are destructive, aren't very, they, very, Nigel? Yeah, cruel. And yeah, yeah. whether it's from a teacher mm. or a parent mm. or yes. even a relative, yeah. uh, they can lodge into our mind and into our hearts. Very much so. And, and hinder our well-being. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a baseline of erroneous information. So what we do for that is inner healing. We pray for inner healing, where we invite Christ into the memory. And I've had some remarkable uh, moments where Jesus sets the captives free from horrific memories. For, for any of our listeners now, Nigel, mm. they've had words, mm -hmm. destructive words yes. spoken to them or yes. over them. Yes. Yes. Would you have a word and pray? Absolutely, yes. What I would say is, if somebody's hurt you, if a, an industry, a, a, a corporation, uh, an individual has hurt you, 
place Jesus himself between you and the perpetrator, shall we say, that you can't even see them. You can't even see that person because Jesus is standing right between you. So Jesus would filter your anger, your disappointment, your, your, your rage, your whatever the emotion is, that Jesus would filter your emotions and vice versa, filter the real or perceived threat from that person. Now, the fascinating thing about healing memories is that you know, whether the person's dead, whether the person's in prison, <coughs> whether the person you've never, hopefully will never see again or have no need to see again because you set healthy boundaries, but to know Christ is there always and he will never leave you or forsake you because Jesus came to set the captives free. So be set free from that trauma. Uh, and there's a lot more to inner healing, um, which we could talk about, but I mean, it, <sighs> Jesus is pretty cool, you know. Look what he did to me. And he can do that to you too, to set you free. Can you pray, Nigel? Yes, absolutely. Dear souls, I pray for you. I pray for you with all my heart, my mind, my body and soul. I pray for the real and perceived wounds that you've received. I pray into the diagnosis that perhaps you have. I pray into the cellular level for your healing of cancer and all other disease. I pray for any doubt, fear. I pray especially for anxiety because that seems to be the soup du jour at the moment particularly post-COVID, I pray for any anxiety you might have, and I pray for peace, absolute peace. Remember what Jesus said, peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. May that peace be with you, way beyond my words. May my words not be limited at all in that peace. I speak into your brain, into your heart, into your being, in Jesus' name. Amen, Nigel. Nigel, thank you so much thank for you. joining us Privilege. on Facing the Canon. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to welcoming you back you. for part two, where we are going to talk about healing. Mm. Thank you for joining us. I hope Nigel's story has inspired you that the Lord can take us and redeem us and he can transform us and use us. So I hope that's uh, given you a faith lift and please join us for part two as we talk together with Nigel on healing and how we can be healed. Thank you again for joining us. Please join us again. <laughs>